the FNAF movie is finally here. The reviews are in, and it's... mixed? Really? Obviously, I'm going to be talking about the film myself, so there will be spoilers. Uh, I'll tell you when they properly start, but let's just talk about it. And more accurately, this is just kind of my thought. I think the reason the film is so mixed in reviews is a combination of, obviously, critics probably aren't super informed on this franchise, and then, in addition, it very much feels like something that you get a lot more enjoyment out of if you've been a fan of this franchise for a long time, because, god, there are so many references of things that are genuinely nearly a decade old now, which is insane to think, but, you know, I think that's the case. And something I've kind of realized, the FNAF community, you kind of either have been there since very early on, like first couple of games, or pretty much just joined with Security Breacher Help Wanted. Which, for clarification, not a bad thing. If you're new to the community, welcome. More voices. The more people throwing their ideas out there for this crazy mess of a franchise, the better. But I do genuinely feel you get a lot more enjoyment out of if you've been a fan for as long as I have. Because there's so much of that that's just very classic FNAF. And genuinely, there are some Easter eggs, some references that I will talk about in the spoiler section. That, like, oh my god, I have not thought about that in genuinely nearly a decade. Wow, that is insane. <laughs> and I think something that really actually helps that argument is, believe it or not, Freddy in Space 3. This thing, Scott released like a week before the movie released, that on Game Jolt is titled, like, The FNAF, The Movie, The Game, something like that. And for clarification, for those who are new to the franchise or just weren't around during this or missed this, before. FNAF, um, 3, Sister Location, and UCN, Scott released troll games that basically looked like, oh, it's next game, it's released early, and then it's just some reskin of an old Scott game. Freddy in Space 3 is not a reskin, but it is that kind of same vibe of, hey look, the thing released early, and then it's just a troll. Which, genuinely, I love the fact he did that, and I love the fact he brought it back for this movie, because again, I think the fact is, this movie does feel like it came out in that kind of like 2014, 2015, 2016 FNAF era. Which, I mean this in the best way possible. Because that is just, as weird as it sounds, for something that genuinely was not even a decade ago, nostalgia. Also, I just have to give the props to the movie for thing that's releasing on American-only streaming service actually being available at the same time in Canada. Seriously, like, for clarification, freaking adore Adventure Time. Um, it's still impossible to watch Fiona and Cake over here. I've seen Fiona and Cake because, thankfully, I was able to do VPN shenanigans, but I am just happy this thing that was supposed to release actually released here as well at the exact same time as everywhere else. But, yeah. I'm really trying to keep this as vague as possible for the before I talk about spoilers. So I guess one last thing to say before we properly get into that. Uh, th this movie's name, uh, this movie's genre is very, very um, not accurate, I think is the best way to put it. It is a horror movie based on a horror franchise that is not at all scary. But without further ado, let's talk about the things that basically I assume we've already seen in the movie. In all fairness, if you're watching a review from a small channel like me, you've probably seen the movie and just want to hear people's thoughts on it. But before we do that, I guess, um, if you have not seen the movie and are a fan of this franchise, highly recommend it. If you are a fan of horror films, eh, if you're a fan of FNAF, like, just watch it. It's really good. I really like it as a FNAF fan. So anyway, let's talk about spoilers. Also, there's a bunch of small details in the film I really want to point out because I think they're really cool. Sadly, as I said, I can't actually really rewatch the movie or get screenshots to show you these things, so you're going to have to, for the most part, trust me, unless it appeared on FNAF Twitter <laughs> and I saw it. But the first thing, and I think this is just really cool, Mike literally has a book on Dream Theory. You know, the thing the entire FNAF community kind of went, 
Oh, the, no, this sucks. This cannot be the answer. And then now, nearly a decade later, we've kind of all agreed. Yeah, that was probably right at the time, wasn't it? Another thing that is super cool, and there are two instances of this in the film, which is insane. One of them I will talk about a little later, and by later I mean right after the next one I'm about to talk about, but there's an animatronic just kind of disheveled and sitting on the floor. It looks like this. Thank you for now, Twitter. And it's friggin' Sparky the dog. Um, for those who don't know, Sparky was like the first hoax in the FNAF community all those years ago. And maybe like, you act like there were hoaxes all the time. There were. For the longest time, I swear, there were so many of them. Um, pretty much before Sister Location is kind of when they started to stop. Uh, definitely a bit also during FNAF 4. But FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 3 era, they were everywhere. Sparky was also referenced at the aptly named Sparky's Diner, which sure was a scene. <laughs> okay, so if you have not seen the movie and you are still here, hi, thanks for the support. Um, you can just look up this scene. It is great. You don't need context for the movie. It might spoil a few things, but oh, it sure is. Um, let me put it like this. It's a bad hat scene. And it was just insane for clarification. My entire, like, genuinely, probably 90% of my theater was like clapping when Matt Pat started speaking. I was super excited too. I mean, hell, he actually confirmed this in his video that released today. Scott insisted his character be named Ness. Genuinely, it was super cool to see Matt in the film, even if just a cameo. Um, I'm sure I can address other cameos with people. I actually did hear a lot of people leaving up that Markiplier wasn't in it at the end of the film when I was leaving. And it's like, he wasn't in the film because of scheduling conflicts. Like, they wanted him to be a part of it. Don't get me wrong, it sucks. But also, like, what did you want him to do? <laughs> Completely abandon all plans he had that week? Albeit, I do think it's pretty fitting. The character he was supposed to play would have actually been, like, the first thing we would have seen in the entire film. Like, first scene is the debut of that character, who got recast because Mark was busy. So, I think that would have been pretty fitting, because for the longest time, his FNAF 1 video was literally, like, the top result for Five Nights at Freddy's. Hell, there's probably a lot of other Easter eggs I either just am forgetting, or missed. But it's still the part, and it's so cool. I really liked it. Although there is one thing I did say in my last video on this movie, so roll the clip! Another thing would potentially be, and this is a complete stretch, but like imagine if we just had like credits music and it's just a song from The Living Tombstone. I'm just saying, his FNAF 1 song is iconic. I'd play a clip of it for you, but I am not going to deal with copyright. And I was right. And by the way, that was not a predictions list. That was literally just a wish list of things I really wanted to see that I think would have been cool. And like, oh, like one, I, I'm glad that it happened. Two, I think it's extra exciting. One, it was literally something I'm like, it's probably not gonna happen, but it would be awesome if it did. And then it did. So that's cool. So anyway, let's talk about characters. We are nearly at 10 minutes into this video and I haven't even remotely talked about anything that is actually part of a film review. I've just talked about tiny little details, which shouldn't be surprising. This is a video about FNAF. <laughs> but before we continue, please consider to like and subscribe since it helps with the channel an absolute ton. Thanks. So yeah, let's talk about characters. First off, Mike. And before we actually talk about him, I gotta love how they genuinely know the start of the film. We're like, about to say his last name, and then don't, because they knew what they were doing. <laughs> but, in all seriousness, he was fine. Don't really care too much, he's kind of a generic protagonist. Like, he's at least involved. He at least has a reason to stay at Freddy's. 
which is really good, because I have had an issue with the Night Guards in these games, because they have never given us a reason, and it's just like, you have almost died five nights in a row, why have you not quit? He actually has a reason, so I'll give him that. But, like, I don't know. He's just kind of generic, I think is probably the best way to put it. Next up is Abby. Also, you've noticed I'm kind of using her stock IMDb profile images. Those were the first image results on Google, and I'm lazy. So, first is not something I would normally do, because, like, these people are actors, they are just, like, it is their job. But since Abby's actress is a child, I will genuinely say this freaking amazing job. Child acting is usually kind of eh, to scuff, to. Why? She did a freaking great job. Abby is genuinely the highlight of the film. Because she was super entertaining, she was super fun. Everything she said felt like something someone her age would say. Like, genuinely, I really like it. Gen seriously, great job. Uh, it was a bit predictable, some of the things they did with her. But, like, she was super fun. I really liked her. Again, highlight of the film. Best character. I hope if we get any character return in the inevitable sequel, that is one of the ones I want to see. Because she's great. I also feel probably partly they did this because they definitely have the most creative liberty with Abby because she's out of the main characters, the one I'm talking about here. The only one that is 100% film original. I'm not sure if Mike is a different character or not, because FNAF lore is confusing. And Vanessa's a weird mismatch of Elizabeth and Vanessa. Because that makes sense. But, like, Abby is, like, the only character who can't really trace back or think of a character that she directly ties to. Which is great. Since I just mentioned her, I figure, let's talk about Vanessa. Yeah, she's fine. I really do not like characters that are like, well, I happen to know all this vital information and I just refuse to tell you any of it for the sake of the plot. Like, this would all have gone by so much easier if you just actually said things. I just never liked that. Like, there are definitely instances where a character should do that. Well, it's like... You actively don't want Abby to die. You also refuse to tell Mike what the threat to Abby is. So which is it? Do you want her dead or not? Again, I just don't really care for the kind of liar revealed esque thing. And you may question if this is technically lying. I think it should count as lying by omission. Because she very much omitted the whole... By the way, the possessed animatronic, which I forgot to tell you they were possessed, are trying to kill your sister thing. Until after they've almost killed his sister. And the movie then has her get stabbed, and will she survive? Probably, because she's an Afton, so she always comes back. William Afton. The character who somehow completely erased the entire existence of Henry Emily. Okay, I'm just gonna mention it since it is his section, but there is a line in the film that says that William Afton is the sole founder of Freddy's. Which is like undeniably wrong. And even if the movie didn't want to acknowledge Henry Emily for the sake of this film, we're probably gonna get sequels, and you probably should acknowledge Henry Emily at least exists. You could have phrased it in a way that it's like, he is one of the, or he's the co-founder, or there is another person that exists and also helped create Freddy's. They are just not important to the plot this exact moment in time. And will this is not Matthew Lillard's acting that's the problem? It's a bit hard to take the main antagonist seriously where they're trying to kill someone and they are giving the exact same voice impression as Shaggy Rogers. Okay.
Okay, I'm editing this and I just cannot take the image of Shaggy staring at the camera while this boss battle music is playing in the background, seriously. Uh, anyway. And for clarification, this complaint is not really Matthew Lillard's fault. It is just the fault of he voiced Shaggy for like 20 years. And that is what most people know him for. And also, <laughs> what most people have heard him from, because let's be honest, I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people have seen at least, like, one episode of one of the, like, five bajillion Scooby-Doo series. And another thing, I do have to give him props. Uh, at the very end, when he gets Springlock, his twitching feels very similar to the twitching of Springtrap from the reveal trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Which, how was that near- I, I cannot get over how old that trailer is. Anyway, let's talk about the story! Which, wow, I have made it 60 minutes into a FNAF video without talking about the convoluted plot. Impressive. But in all seriousness, it feels a very toned down, very simplified, very retcon -y. But in all fairness, I do think to just- Introduce the franchise to people. Possessed animatronics by the dead, by ghost children from the killer who happens to own the restaurant is definitely the easiest and quickest way to summarize this franchise. Until we start acknowledging the fact that fun times exist. How does half this technology exist in the time periods they're from? Have you seen the sister location to animatronics? But genuinely, I think the story's pretty easy. Good reasons to do things. As I said, when I talked about Mike, his character motivation actually makes a lot of sense. Really, the plot is basically Mike gets a job at a Freddy's establishment so he can have a job so he doesn't lose custody of his little sister. And also really wants to kill William Afton, who he doesn't know is William Afton or his boss. Also, dead ghost children possessing giant animatronics. You know, the usual. Anyway, since I don't really have much to say on the story, let's finish this video off by talking about the visuals. Which I'm very mixed on. So yeah, visuals. Um, first things first, the animatronics look freaking great. Love how they're straight up actual animatronics. Hate how they move. And this is not a, oh, I don't like how they move because it's uncanny. I wish they were uncanny. They are way too fluid in how they turn their bodies. And it is not good. I, I do not like it. Like, they will fully make a very clean 360 degree turn to look at someone. Like, I would love it if they even just snapped their face into place. Like, they just move their head and it just quickly snaps to look at what they're looking at. Because that would be so much better and hell, more faithful of the games. But, in general, I like the designs of the animatronics, but how they move is way too human-like. Anyway, the pizzeria itself. Great. Love it. Super faithful recreation of the original game. I like the new changes. I like the stylizations they made. I think it just looks great. Genuinely. Really cool. I really like it. It gets more ruined as the film goes on. Uh, I do wish it didn't look as pristine as it did. And honestly, that kind of goes for the animatronics as well. Because they are relatively abandoned. Like, I think how it looks near the end of the film should be how it starts. And then by the end of the film, it's even worse off. Because this looks like it closed yesterday. Not an indefinite amount of time ago. The costumes are fine. They look like things normal people would wear. So I think they're really good at their job. I could go like, oh, the mall looks... It's a literal mall that exists in the real world. I'm not complimenting the set design of a mall they filmed in. Which, for clarification, filming in malls, super cool. Um, years ago, a film actually was shooting at my local mall, and that was just cool. Is the film good? Eh, not really. I'm not going to say what it is, and I barely even watched the film myself, I just kind of know it based on reviews and like five clips I've seen. But honestly, I think 
it looks really good. Like all of the sets that were actually made, even the edits to things like the whatever shop Mike was at. I, I don't know what that is they were selling. The fact there's the freaking Chica's Magic Rainbow just there giving everyone PTSD. Either way, if you're a fan of this franchise or want to watch a film that is somehow less scary than Security Breach, I'd recommend it. I'll see you guys in the next one.